I'm a great believer if you can laugh at something, it won't defeat you. If you can laugh at laughter is internal jogging. That's what I've always it's the antidote in troubled times and it's it's just a release valve. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a stand-up comedian with impeccable international insights and integrity. He's lovingly referred to as Ireland's ambassador of comedy and is known for his quick wit and versatility. He has made over 300 television appearances and has an almost encyclopedic knowledge of comedy, enabling him to tailor his performance to any audience and venue. His work with such international stars as Shirley Bassey, Banning Manilow and Gladys Knight and the Pips has made him one of the most sought after comedians in Great Britain. In addition to his ability to captivate comedy and corporate crowds alike, He's renowned as one of the world's most resilient performers, bouncing back from a stroke that threatened to sideline him from splitting sides. He has developed the world-famous 3L formula, living life with laughter. Adrian Walsh, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Well, Paul, what an introduction. I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> And nor can our audience, I'm sure. <laughs> Adrian, lovely to see you. I, I know um, that you were born in Bangor in Northern Ireland. Now, no, no, I, I was actually brought up in Bangor, Northern Ireland, but I was born in oh. a place called Banbridge. But there was another comedian there called Gene Fitzpatrick. And when I heard that he was there, I moved out when I was eight months old. I didn't make competition. <laughs> Well, obviously, comedy was very important to you, even from eight months old. Of course, um, was, of course. Was, it, was comedy and humour valued in your family and in your community? Oh, very, very, very much so. Uh, my dad took me to the theatre when I was about eight years old. It was the Empire Theatre in Belfast, a famous old vaudeville theatre. And the thing I can remember most is standing outside and the buskers you had a show before you went in and as an eight-year-old I thought that was a show <laughs> I honestly did then we went in and there was a comedian came on now at eight years old I had no idea what he was talking about but I loved the ambience and, and the sound of laughter was the young Adrian Waltz already compelled to be funny were you already practicing how to be funny I, I was always a I always like things that made adults laugh and that attracted me. And then uh, I developed from that. And I, uh, when I was in school, I had a double act with a fellow called George Emerson. And I was a straight man. A lot of people say things haven't changed much. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, did this double act actually make you popular at school? I mean, did it help in gaining confidence and ability to find friends? What what happened? Yeah, well, I, I gravitated to people that made me laugh. And George, bless him, he had no filter. George was one of these people. He, he, he used to come into school and if he was late. A lot of this wouldn't make sense to any of your listeners. But the teacher would say, Emerson, why are you late? He said, I was coming to work and my egg and my yolk broke. It used to be an advert, go to work on an egg. Yeah. And then the other thing he used to go, uh, why are you late, Emerson? I was eating my too good to hurry mince with the Murray mince advert. So George was quite topical and not even knowing it. And of course, Walsh was always the one that would laugh out loud and make the mistake. But also at school, I was, this, I was dyslexic at school. I didn't know that then. And when I was asked to stand up and read, uh, I, I, when I came to a word I, I couldn't pronounce, the way I got around that, I used to put in my own words. And then I found out I was getting laughs with that. 
but then the teacher, a Mr. McDonald, at the beginning, I used to hide behind people and who wants to read? So I would put my hand up between people and I didn't really want to read. But then at the end, I couldn't wait to get up so I could get laughs, but he wouldn't pick me anymore. <laughs> well, sit down and stop misbehaving. And that, that attracted me more than knowledge actually did, going for the laugh. Presumably, uh, at the time, there was no word for dyslexia. Um, it was because, I mean, I remember I had a brother who, were, you know, uh, people just said, you know, he, he doesn't get it. He's a, he's a bit thick. Um, no, no, well, well, funny enough, years later, I was, I was working and I got into trouble because I did a joke about how life has changed. If I'd have gone home to my dad and said, Dad, uh, they think I'm dyslexic. And my dad said, no, you're not. You're just stupid, son. And afterwards, a lady came up to me and she said, uh, I'm a senior lecturer at a university. And I don't know why she said that to begin with. And she said, I took great exception to the joke you did about dyslexia. I said, well, if it hadn't been for dyslexia, I wouldn't be making a living as a comedian because I couldn't pronounce the words. And I used to put in my own words, which got me laughs. And she said to me, a fine story. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So she obviously wanted, it was all about what offended her. and It is. And, and do you think people are too easily offended now? Well, we live in a world today where we have chronically offended people. Who, if they're not offended, they know somebody who might be offended or should be offended. And I think there's an American comic, I can't recall his name at the moment. He said, being offended by a joke was like going into an art gallery and throwing a tea towel over the paintings that you don't like. Oh, that's so nobody analogy. else can see them. Because every joke, the basis of a joke is a target at the end of it. And every joke offends somebody. And when you, the thing, one of the first things I learned about comedy is when you walk on stage, you're the only one in that room facing the wrong way. <laughs> And you have no idea of those people's political views, their medical records, what emotions they're going through at the time. They've had an argument with somebody, somebody in the family is ill. And, and your sole purpose out there, you want them to make, you want them to have a wonderful evening. No comic deliberately goes out to a fan, but I do believe you've got to push the envelope because if you don't, would we still stuck doing jokes that people used to do in the 1400s? That's really interesting because, as I mentioned in the introduction, you yourself had a stroke in uh, 2015, I think it was, and you talk about it in your routine. And I know that uh, you say that a medical crisis is no laughing matter, uh, no. but well, your medical crisis, but you say that a good comedian always speaks about what he knows. True, is it true. in truth? Is it important? to be able to find a way to laugh at illness. Uh, uh, very much so. But I always say to young comics, because when, when I was a young comedian, uh, there were no comedy stores. You couldn't go in and try five minutes somewhere. Our comedy stores were the working men's clubs because that's what was available. I've often believed that if those comics were alive today, they would be doing what the great young comics are doing of today. I was lucky enough to do a radio show where Arthur Askey, and he said a lovely thing about comedy. He said, every generation is good and every generation is bad. And at the end of the day, it's a matter of taste. And yep. the strange thing about a comic is you can be the greatest surgeon, the greatest accountant, the greatest painter in the world. But even if you're the highest paid comic in the world, I, I remember reading Joan Rivers' book about uh, Still Talking, where she at the time was a highest paid comic in Vegas, man or woman. And a lady, uh, a friend of hers come to see her that she'd gone to college with and then went out for dinner afterwards. And that lady sat there and tried to tell Joan Rivers what she was doing wrong. <laughs> my, my dad said something to me once. He said, everybody's got two jobs. They've got their own job and they're all experts in show business. Right. Well, yeah. It's like us, we love football, but you know, we, we sit there and we, uh, it's much easier looking at it from, from a distance. You talk about your own stroke and make it funny on well, stage. Yeah. Well, I've done that, but I've still had letters complaining about that. Well, that's I'm what I wanted to know. I did jokes about my stroke, not other people's strokes. 
when I had my stroke, I was on stage. I did two 45 minutes while I was having a stroke. Jeez. And the joke that I do, which at least I got to know how my audiences feel when they watch my act. <laughs> and, and I'm a great believer. If you can laugh at something, it won't defeat you. If you can laugh at laughter is internal jogging. That's what I've always said. It's the antidote in troubled times. And it's, it's just a release valve. But I, I completely agree with you because that's what the whole humorology project is about, is actually a, about understanding that humour can actually be a salve for mental health or, or, or whatever. Do, do you think humour actually, in that sense, aids resilience? Very much. Have you ever heard of a man called Norman Cousins? Yes, yes. He's a, yeah, he wrote a, a, two books, uh, uh, The Healing Heart and The Anatomy of an Illness. And when he was 39 years old, he had a massive heart attack and he was told to go home and just sit there and, and do nothing. And he always enjoyed laughs. And in those days, this is how long ago it was, he used to watch daytime television, which was the Three Stooges, I Love Lucy and the Phil Silver Show. And he, he just spent his time watching comedy and reading comedy books. And when he went back for another checkup and they checked his heart, the heart had formed its own bypass. Because they say wow. laughter releases endorphins throughout the body that are far more powerful than, than uh, morphine as far as suppressing pain. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm the furthest thing from the intellect of that world than anybody can ever be. But that's what I read. No, well, it's absolutely true because, I mean, it releases neuropeptides um, to fight stress. I mean, there's dopamine, there's serotonin, there's the endorphins, as you just said. And actually, there is um, a lot of quite interesting medical ed evidence that people who smile, people who laugh, recover faster from stress. You know, I mean, the, the oxytocin is um, the stress hormone. And, um, you know, that's the one that releases those warm, fuzzy feelings uh, that we get. So actually, uh, humour is a cure. How important do you think that is that you can take something that is intrinsically dark and make light of it? Is, is that a part of the, the human condition that that we can control, if you like. Well, it's a strange thing. When, when I had my stroke, because I didn't have the, the normal symptoms of a stroke, all I had was heavy legs. It was the next day that I got the, the I was paralyzed down the right-hand side and my mouth had dropped and they took me into hospital. And I, I thought it was Bell's palsy because bless my mother-in-law had had that. And I thought, oh, I must have got Bell's palsy. And then took me for a scan. And, then they brought me back and the doctor came in and this was in Madeira. Uh, and the doctor came in, he said, uh, Mr. Walsh, he said, you've had a, a major stroke. The next 48 hours are crucial. He said, whatever you do, uh, get some rest and relax. <laughs> Which rest and relax and you're waiting for another stroke. And I lay there and I thought to myself, I must be the only person in the world that's had a stroke that's thinking, this is 20 minutes material. I never thought it was going to half. Oh, good. Well, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Because I know that your stroke, the, the, the usually the kind of stroke you had, 80% of people either die or get locked out in syndrome. But you have that optimistic attitude where you're already thinking about uh, this is material uh, somewhere. From a psychological perspective, 95% uh, of your emotions, both positive and negative, are influenced by how you talk to yourself. It sounds like you had optimism in the nth degree. How important is optimism, A, to recovering, and B, to being a great comedian? Well, do you know something? I, I want to tell you something now, and my wife will verify this. <laughs> it took me 20 months to get back to work, and... Uh, one of the major things that got me back to work, I just bought a new pair of dress shoes in Bond Street. The most I'd ever paid for a pair of dress shoes. And I loved them. And I'd only had them three weeks. And I didn't, I didn't want them to go to waste. <laughs> and, and that's how simple it was. It was 
I focused on those dress shoes. You give me something. I'm, I'm definitely going to wear them again. And then some of, I know we're going through a crisis with the NHS now, but all, all I can say is when I got home from the dare after three weeks in the hospital, I had a, a physiotherapist in the house every day for 10 weeks and then a speech therapist. And even the thing with a the speech therapist, you learn uh, tongue twisters. Uh, give Papa a cup of proper coffee and a copper coffee cup. She shifted thistles through her thistle shifter. Why in the world would a whale want water? When a whale wants water, will a well run dry? Betty bought a bit of butter, but she found the butter better, so she bought a better, better butter to make the better butter better. And the ironical thing about that is, I couldn't have said that before I had a stroke. <laughs> Laughing at myself and doing doing silly things. And if you can't laugh at yourself, there are, I have met people that believe to laugh at their themselves lowers their dignity, where I believe it's the total opposite. I, I agree with you because I, I think if you can't laugh at yourself, I think there's an, uh, an element of uh, psychopathy about people who can't laugh at themselves because it, 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 it's like my dignity is taken away from me uh, at that. How important do you think that is? Because a lot of our listeners are, are, are in business or whatever. To be, if you're leading a business, how important is it to be able to laugh at yourself? Very much so. I, I, remember I, I did about 20 years in the corporate market, which can be a very difficult market. You know that, Paul. I remember one doing, uh, it, it was for the Royal Bank of Scotland or the Bank of Scotland. Can't remember which it was, but it was a video link to, to all their branches. Uh, and the head went on. But he walked on stage and the first thing he did was he folded his arms. And then he, and to me, that closed him right in. Closed him right in. And I've had, I remember doing a thing at the, uh, the Savoy Hotel for a, a group of accountants and the guy stood up and he said, uh, our next speaker, I'm, I'm told, is very funny. He said, I think we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Oh, nice, no, it, lovely introduction. You know, it kills you stone dead. Yeah. So I, I stood up and had a right go at him to start with, and, and he didn't like it, but he had he tied me in knots before he even got up. I thought to myself, what a wonderful build-down. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what he had done for me. Well, I absolutely. And, and, and what people don't realise is how important that first sort of initial you know, five, 10 seconds is on stage for the comedian. So if you get introduced by like that, it, it can blow everything out of the water. Yeah, I seen somebody once introduced, uh, I was a big fan of Phyllis Diller. Uh, she was a, a great stand-up Phyllis Diller. She did her, her first DVD when she was 90 years old, bless her. Oh, wow. And somebody introduced her one night as the funniest woman in the world. Now, you can't live up to that. Nobody can. Yeah. Nobody can live up to an introduction like that. Or the, the other one I remember do, doing a club years ago where a fella had my biog, but, which is, you know, selling yourself. But he, he read the whole two pages. <laughs> By the time I got on, they were half asleep. <laughs> and this is a, a great bit of advice for anybody who has to introduce anybody on stage. He, just, he said, just make three statements in ascending order until you get to the you know da 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 ladies and gentlemen adrian walsh yeah. <laughs> and, and and he said whatever you say it will sound better than if you go oh um here's some stuff about um he's been on telly 300 times mm -hmm. you know it, it, you know but whatever you say because some of it is about rhythm isn't it Oh, oh, listen, uh, it's amazing how uh, many comedians were drummers at one time. They've got that rhythm about themselves. Uh, now, I, when I was a young performer, every comic finished with a song. And I took singing lessons with a lady called Leela Webster, who was still performing when she was 90. And after two weeks, Leela gave me my money back. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you I actually breathe out of tune, Paul. I've, my dad taught music with the army, and my dad wow. could 
quite proficient. He could sight re read music and he had perfect pitch in his ear, but it, it didn't come down to me or my brother. Right. Uh, it sounds you, you, like you, a challenge. I, you, I, I'm going to get you to sing a song by the end of the... Uh, <laughs> I remember Danny LaRue, I did a couple of summers with Danny LaRue and uh, they used to finish with the song, uh, I am what I am. And I used to mime it. And Danny was such a, he, he was a so-and-so at times, bless him. And he, he would walk in front of me and put the mic under my feet, on him. Because <laughs> he knew I was uh, just miming it. That, I mean, it's amazing that, that your history in comedy is extraordinary. And you, you're mentioning uh, Danny LaRue, who is, you know, uh, huge. And you've worked with thousands and thousands of comedians over your career. Um, I remember it just reminded me of a quote that, that Billy Crystal said of Rob, Robin Williams. He needed those extra little hugs that you only get from strangers. Uh, do you think that there is something the intrinsic about all comedians that they're needy and they do need those extra little hugs. Now, do you know, people always say that's a very good question. And the reason they say that because they haven't got a clue what the answer is. <laughs> I, I think there's a possibility that because uh, when you have a great night as a comic, uh, there's no better feeling. I've always said that people in the audience will never lose with a comic because if they get laughs, that's great and they go out of there happy. And if the comic dies on his ass, they all walk out of there going, thank God I'm not him. <laughs> the amazing thing is uh, about comedy is, uh, I believe what Jerry Seinfeld said, I like all comics. I don't care if they're original. I don't care if they're telling old jokes. I don't care if they're blue. I don't care if they're clean. I don't think, care if they're political. I, I admire their bravery. Larry Marshall always used to say, uh, about comedians was, you can say anything about them, they can be right so-and-so's, whatever, but you cannot, their bravery, they walk out there and there's there's nothing behind them. There's no songs, there's no impressions. Because when you reject a comedian, you're rejecting him. You're not saying, I don't like the songs. I don't like the impressions. I don't like the instrument. I just don't like you. And every comic, if you go on YouTube, and look at all the great comics, there'll be as, about a third of people dislike them. Can you believe there was people in life didn't find Morecambe and Wise funny, didn't find Tommy Cooper was funny, but I met them. I, I was on the show that Tommy Cooper died on. I was on that night. I was the opening comedian that night. I think Tommy looked at my act and thought, this is the end of show business. <laughs> I'm getting out of here, bless him. But he was hysterical even during the band call. Even during the band call, he'd walk on and people automatically laughed at everything he did. But it, it became hard for him because he couldn't say anything serious. Because yeah. if he had a turn, I can't do impressions. If Tommy Cooper turned around and said, me, me dad died this morning. People would laugh because of the way he said it. I, I'm interested because we had uh, Omid Jalili on the show. And he I, thought said, he, I thought he was brilliant, by the way. And it's all uh, brilliant. He is brilliant. Yeah, no, he is brilliant. But he said um, comedians are people who need the laughter of strangers to validate us. We're all mentally ill. Is that taking it too far? Or is it just that, that you are addicted to the laughter and the drug, uh, the drugs that it releases in, in your brain? Do you know that wonderful expression a great American politician once said, we have nothing to fear in life but fear itself? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we, and comics are, are guilty of this, we overthink things. We, yeah. re we really do o overthink them. And I think that's what messes them up sometimes. Uh, when, I, when I was doing a summer season when I was 17 years old, I was with two old comedians, vaudeville comedians, George Daniels and Jimmy Fletcher. And I sat in the middle of them and they taught me how to put makeup on. And they would give me advice about certain things. Uh, and I remember one, one night coming off, shaking my head because I hadn't had a good night. And George pulled me into the dressing room and he gave me a, a telling off. He said, don't ever, ever do that in your life. He said, you go back and you take your own course like you stormed them. But the other bit of advice, couple of bits of advice he gave me was, he said, when you have a great night and the applause and everyone's loving you, he said, enjoy it. He said, 
but don't believe it. Mm -hmm. It's for that moment, it's in that moment. And, and, and then Jimmy Fletcher said something to me, he said, in your life, son, you're gonna have some great nights. And in your, night, you're, in your life, you're gonna have some terrible nights. He said, but no matter how bad that night is, remember one thing, anyone in the graveyard would swap with you. I, I agree. And, and uh, obviously, you know, this is essentially a business podcast because people will listen to this so that they, they can take away things as well as be entertained and amused. And, and the, what advice would you give to somebody? Everybody at some stage has to get up and, and do a speech, whether that's at a wedding or in their company or at a conference or something. What is the, the, the piece of advice? Because you've talked about warmth. How do you do that? But, you know, you've, you've stated this quite a few times and so, so many of your guests about standing in front of an audience is above death. Yeah, the fear, the biggest fear in the world is, uh, yeah, is um, speaking in public and death is number six on that list. Well, I've done both at the same time. <laughs> I think when, when you get up to speak, that audience wants you to be funny. They, they, business can be so serious nowadays and everybody's going for the bottom line and everybody's push, push, push. And I've written speeches for, for many businessmen, but I, I try and put, I, I try to say, don't, don't put your jokes in, put aside in, little asides and be yourself. And when, when you walk on there, it's not that important. Even if it doesn't go well, my first television show was a, a show called Be My Guest for Granada TV. I think I was about 22 at the time. And Paul Daniels was hosting it. And Paul said to me, are you nervous? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm breaking it as you would your first TV show. And Paul said a lovely thing to me. He said, you know, if you go well, that's great. And if you don't go well, you know, that's not so good. He said, but the Queen will still be the Queen. The prime minister will still be the prime minister, and it won't change anything. Don't put too much importance on it. I, I think that's a great bit of advice, and not putting too much importance on it. And and uh, the funny thing is, uh, the, with my background in psychology, what I try to do with people is I I say, really don't have an ambition to make people laugh because it's it's too big a leap. And it's like, I must make them laugh. Actually, really what you want to do is if you can connect with them, that's yeah. good enough. And by the way, the laughs are more likely to come right. if you've connected it's like with them. The person. I remember doing a thing. It was the first time I did an all ladies dinner and the, ch the chairwoman was there and she got up to speak before me. And she'd suffered for, uh, she had multiple cirrhosis and uh, she got up. And she, she started talking about it. And she said, and the trouble is, it, at the end of it, she said, the biggest trouble was you never get ready on time. And she took her, her little uh, hat off that she, she had on, and she still had her curlers in underneath it. Uh -huh. And it brought the house down. It brought just a simple thing like that. But she talked about what she knew. That laugh takes me on to my next question, which is what makes you laugh, Adrian? I think what makes me laugh now is getting old because, uh, August the 10th last year, I turned 50 and 264 months. You're looking good on it. Yeah, so you want a calculator on that one? <laughs> that makes you laugh because it's inevitable, because it's the, your current situation? Yeah, yeah, but, but it's also some of the things you do as you're getting older. Uh, I'll go through a few of these, Paul, and see what's happening in your life. <laughs> Have you ever got in the shower, turned the shower on, and you look down, and you got your socks off? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not one yet. But you will do, you will do. Uh, another couple is, uh, have you ever taken a pair of glasses off that you haven't actually got on? <laughs> have you ever tried to put a pair of glasses on top of the pair of glasses you've already got on? <laughs> The wonderful thing about glasses is that the exercise you get, unbelievable looking for them. And then as you get older, you find yourself halfway up the stairs. You don't know whether you're going up to come down or down to come up. And the dog's at the bottom of the stairs going, he's going to feed me again. 
And I've no, I've no idea, at the age of 72, I've no idea why they call us old farts, because believe you me, at this age, there's a new one every 10 seconds, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to lower the tone there. Oh well, yeah. Well, that's just uh, no, disgraceful. No, they, even the body, the body starts to fall down. I'm at the age now. I actually look younger when I'm hanging upside down. <laughs> look, look, look at this. I've got the DNA for turkey, Paul. <laughs> I, the first time I discovered that was I thought to myself, I don't have to drive. I don't have to buy a travel pillow anymore. <laughs> if I asked you, because a lot of people, and as I said before, listen to the podcast for business tips and uh, things. If I asked you to write a business case for humour, what would you include in that? It's really of... why, why should businesses uh, encourage humour in the workplace? Why, why you, should they? Because if you've got a relaxed atmosphere, People are going to be a lot more productive, and that atmosphere is, is is relaxed because people have the ability to laugh themselves and laugh at life, and then get on with it. It gives you that little lift during the day. It's like a little injection of adrenaline. And and why not try it? If you go if you're going into work every day dreading that your boss or anyone else is miserable, you, you you're not going to be productive. It's going to close you down. You, 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 you have often said it, when you go into the subconscious, especially when you're writing jokes and you're not even thinking about it, you be your most productive. But when you yeah. think really, when you think too hard, it, it stifles you. It, it makes you tense, tighten up. We all want to be around people that, that are a joy to be around. I, I think you've touched on something that's really interesting, that, that when people are relaxed, they are more creative and so they can bring more to your business and also that relaxed atmosphere means uh, i think communication is clearer and better because when people are tense their ability to communicate diminishes when you go into businesses and you, you, uh, even a, a, at a function you can sense what that business is like the atmosphere and yeah. you can also sense when you do a joke, if they look at the top guy, whether he's going to laugh or not, if you're free to do jokes about the top guy, you know, you know there's a good atmosphere there. So on that point, do you think that you can be a great communicator without intrinsically understanding humour? What was it? The Rabbi Lionel Blue once said, a lesson taught with humour is a lesson learned. Oh, that's nice. You're going, going back to teachers, uh, I remember I left a secondary school and went to a technical college and we hadn't done any uh, mechanical drawing where the other kids had done three or four years in front of it. We had a teacher called Hatton Wilson and Hatton Wilson had a wonderful personality and enjoyed a laugh with the lads. And he got us all through our, our O levels as it was in those days. Uh, the top three grades, everybody in the class. And it was just the way he taught. And, and, and we relaxed with him. We went in. We weren't fearful about it. And he didn't put too much emphasis on, on the end result. He put the emphasis on, on the learning and enjoying the learning. Well, it's really interesting that, that you, you putting those two things together, that, that the learning and the laughter, because I do think that, that learning is enhanced by laughter. And, and, and that's why I asked the question about what, what can it bring to business? But too often I see um, people going, you know what, the, the first thing that's going to have to go is the training budget or this or that. Whereas the last thing it should go is the training budget or the away days or the fun, because then you're fighting an uphill battle about the, the whole feeling in the company, the, 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 the way people communicate on the, the basic level. Well, you're, you, what you're doing is breaking the team up. Ah, oh, that's interesting. But because I remember going to do a, a dinner once uh, at JCB, the headquarters there, and I walked in and it was 10, 10 tables, but there was about 15 to 20 feet between them. And I remember an old pro saying something to me when you went to do a corporate. He said, when you see that, he said, 
get the tables moved a bit closer. He said, because what you've got is 10 audiences. Yeah. You've got 10 audiences instead of one audience. And it's like, w when you walk out onto a theater and you don't have many people in and they're seated all over the place, they act individually, they don't act as an audience. And if your team are not happy together, they will act as individuals and they will act in their own interest instead of acting in the interest of everybody. Because I, I don't think it's just, uh, uh, it's not about making people laugh. It's having good humour yeah. to be uh, to be full of bonhomie and, and good humour. But, but isn't it lovely to be around up people? I have, I have met people, they've, they've got a problem for every solution. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and, after, and after a while you go, why don't you try this? Why don't you? And then they come up on, and you go, oh. And you can feel your, your body language, you can feel your shoulders going and your head going. And you just, oh, what's the point? You don't want people like that. But isn't all business about relationships? Is, uh, in fact, there's a, 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 an American study that says 85% of all your success in life is down to the quality of your relationships. And, and laughter really is the lifeblood of any relationship, isn't it? Well, well even, even in marriages, more people stay together because they laugh together than for any other reason. And here speaks a man, 50 years married. You know, well, it's the old gag. You know, I'm a survivor you know. of everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, you, you could have killed a man and been out by now. You know, the, 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 the old gags. No wrong with an old gag in the right place. Don't don't forget, some gags are so old that they're new again, Paul. Well, actually, I always say there's no such thing as an old gag. There's just a new audience. Yeah, and then if somebody's using old gags, surely recycling is not a problem. Is it? That's it. There you are. We're thinking of the planet. Yeah, thinking of the planet. <laughs> but, but, but it's uh, no. One of the side effects I had after my stroke, uh, I'd wake up in the middle of the night laughing. And then they would say, a lot of old jokes used to come into my head. And it's just silly, stupid, idiotic jokes. One of the by byproducts of a stroke is you, you get plasticity, which your body moves and shakes and the muscles jump uh, right at the beginning. And I'll never forget, my kids bought me a, a Fitbit and I used that to try and increase my steps and, and, and on the road to recovery. And one night I fell asleep in bed with my Fitbit on. And when I woke up in the morning, I'd done 196 steps. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't left the bed. But, but waking me up all the time, I was waking up and then trying to get to sleep. And then these stupid jokes would come into my head. But thankfully, through neuroplasticity, a lot of that is gone. Well, you're building new neural pathways, aren't you? Yeah. Literally, so, uh, and that is what neuroplasticity is, isn't it? Yeah. So you you have to build the, the, them again. It's just, fantastic. Just don't ask me to spell it, Paul. <laughs> well, but I, I, exactly. Uh, but, but actually, it, it's really interesting that you know. As you talked about being a survivor in marriage, but you are a survivor in life. And actually, I love the fact that you've you've created so much based on humour. And I would actually argue that, you know, we're all going to get sick at some stage in our lives. Life is a terminal disease. Nobody ever gets out of it alive, do they? No, but understanding that actually you can overcome some of the biggest obstacles in life as you have through the assiduous use of laughter. Well, well, Vivian and I laugh a lot and we laugh a lot at the same things. And I honestly believe uh, my mum was one of six girls. And I think women have a better sense of humour sometimes than men have. I don't think women take themselves as seriously as men do. Well, maybe they just laugh at men who... <laughs> <laughs> That's probably... Well, 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 it's one of the jokes I, I, I do about my stroke, where I, I lost two stone when I had my stroke, but I, I go to the gym three days a week and then I work out at home three days a week. Saturday's football day. But I, I put on 14 pound back on in muscle, pure muscle. 
And I do the joke about standing in the bedroom in my jockey shorts, reflexing. And I look at my wife and I said, what would you like to do with this body? And she said, identify it. (laughs) (laughs) It's a great gag. (laughs) Uh, That is a great gag. Uh, Which takes us to the part of the show that we like to call Quick Fire Questions. Quick Fire Questions! We'll take it slow with me, Paula. We'll take it not too far. (laughs) Who is the funniest business person that you've met? I work with many over the years, but the one I I really enjoyed was uh, Tony Ball. Tony Ball was a man at lunch to many. And also he, uh, he's Michael Ball's father. Oh, the really? singer. Yeah, Tony Ball was a wonderful speaker, absolutely superb. But why was he so good? What did he do that was different and better? Well, well he talked about life and he talked about himself. And, and the other one of a great, uh, he started off as a businessman speaker, was Bob the Cat Bevan. Oh, yeah, I remember. Bob is very, very good. Uh, lots of them. And, oh, but it almost surprises me sometimes how bad some of them are, looking back. And surely nerves as well. I've seen them, you know, hold a script and, and, and be shaking. What, what would you give? I mean, because talking about nerves, obviously I work with people who have nerves. and things. What's, what's your biggest piece of advice for people to get over nerves? Plenty of work on what you're going to do, but then before you go on, distract yourself from it. Don't think about it, because the brain will work overtime, and and you'll be working. You know, you know that lovely thing about somebody once said to me about if you're sitting at home, and you crunch up a piece of paper and you go, and it goes straight in the waste paper bin. But if there's three or four people around and you try and do it, it'll never go in the bin. Didn't they do that lovely thing with 20 young cricketers and they brought them in and they said there's a blue patch in front of the wickets. And these were young lads who were going to be professional cricketers. Said if you, if you hit the blue patch, you stay in, in the game. And 19 or 18 hit the blue patch and, and then they, they brought them in the next day. Uh, 20 different young lads who said if you miss the blue patch, you're out. And there's only seven of them hit it. It's where you put your attention. But isn't it some, somebody said about golf? Golfers do it. I don't know about the story about 10,000 times, putting 10,000 times. Uh, you do it from the back of your, your brain. But then once you bring it to the forward of your brain, you overthink it. Which is, by the way, why the first chapter of my first book in the, the Pitching Bible was called It's All About Them, because... And I think I've said this on the show before, but the, the conscious mind can only hold between five and nine pieces of information, whereas the Not unconscious many. mind... Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, some of us. Uh, but the unconscious mind holds millions of pieces of information. And if, if somebody said to you, you have to remember every joke you're about to do... You're dead, yeah. You're dead. And actually what you have to do is uh, the same way that when we have a chat, we just engage with each other and allow all the unconscious to come up. So that's kind of my tip for nerves is put your attention deeply somewhere else, whether that's one person or an audience yeah. or something else, and you'll do it. Listen, I listened to something once that Peter Smagel was talking about, and he said he asked an old goalkeeper, he said, have you got any advice? He said, it's simple. He said, what do you mean simple? He said, do your job. He said, what do you mean? He said, don't go out there and press the manager. Don't go out there and press the rest of the players. Don't go out there and press anybody in the crowd. Just focus on your job. Do your job. Do the best of your ability and enjoy it. When I first went into show business, uh, I grew up in the, in the 60s. I, I loved the Beatles, the Hollies, all that. And, and the one person I, I never really got was Frankie Vaughan. My mum loved Frankie Vaughan. My first week's cabaret in Park Hall at Chorley, after doing working men's clubs for a few years, and you gravitate, gravitate to the working men's clubs 
There's 44 of them all around Britain. Was it in Park Hall at Chorley? I was with Frankie Vaughan. And I sat and watched him every night for seven nights. He was sensational. And he said to me a couple of things. He said, when you walk on stage, he said, stop halfway and take a bow. And I said, why, Frankie? He said, let them look at the suit. <laughs> he said, because the first 20 seconds, they listen with their eyes. Uh -huh. And he said, it also gives you time to compose yourself. And you've taken your mind off what you're thinking about. You're going, hey, what do you think of the suit? Now, that doesn't, not nowadays, I suppose, that all, the dressing is totally changed. Uh, but it, it worked in those days. But I never seen anyone get bows the way Frankie Vaughan did. He was a master craftsman at it. I did five years with Val Dunigan. And the way he walked around stage, and he never changed a word in the act one night, but you would have sworn it was the first time he ever told those stories. He was, I used to say to young comics, go and watch Val Dunigan. I don't want to watch him for, I said, he's 26 years on live television. I said, the man is a master craftsman in what he does. Go and watch the way he walk, walks around the stage, the warmth, the little asides, the little laughs here and there. It's like choreography at its best. And by the way, the best thing you can ever do, and this is a, a, for all our listeners, is to actually uh, model people who do it. You know, you said Val Dunican was a blast from the past, but 26 years on television. He had the, I went out to Canada with him and everything, uh, but he had audiences. No matter how well I did, and I, I never had a bad night with Val, I'm gonna put my hand on my heart and say that, no matter how well I did, he walked on to a bigger applause because they'd come to see him. Yeah, and he, but, he, but he was relaxed in who he was. And I remember the first night, he said, tonight I'd like to introduce you to my special guest star. And I turned around to see who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I think in life, and this is a, a humorology tip, is that people forget to compliment each other and, 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 and say something nice. Find something nice to say about somebody today. If you're listening to this podcast, find something nice to say about somebody. You'll change the way they feel about you. It's, I mean, one of those simple things in life. Um, anyway, what book makes you laugh, Adrian? Well, as you know, we've talked about this. There it is. Gary Marshall. It's Wake Me When It's Funny. It's the autobiography uh, of a writer in Vegas and on television. And the comics used to get drunk or high on pot. And they always used to say to him, don't you wake me unless it's funny. Now that's a pressure. It's a wonderful <laughs> book and I really enjoyed it. Oh, fantastic. I, I'm, I'm, I must reread it. What film makes you laugh? I love anything by Mel Brooks always made me laugh. But going back, one of the first films I remember made me laugh consistently. And I've watched it again quite a few times. It's, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Just as some, some wonderful 38, 38 stars in that movie. They made little cameos in it. Wonderful comics like Dick Sean. Have you ever seen Dick Sean? I only in that film. Yeah. But if you look Dick Sean up on YouTube, you'll see where Robin Williams got his, his inspiration from, as, long, as well as Jonathan Winters. Well, let's take a shift to the other side now, because um, I always ask my guests, what's not funny? I think every comic has got their own filter. You know, I think it was Chaplin that said, when it bends, it's funny. When it breaks, it's not funny. So if the guy falls down and gets straight up again, it's funny. If he falls down and his leg's broken and they've got to send for an ambulance, it's not funny. Mm. And then they always say, you know the Gilford, Gilbert Gottfried line, too soon. Some things are too soon, but within time, everybody will laugh at them. So you're, you would go with the um, uh, comedy is tragedy plus time? Probably. Probably. I, I remember 
a wonderful Liverpool comedian died. And there's a lot of comics turned up at the funeral. And the coffin was going through in the crematorium. And one of the comics turned around to the other comic and he said, what a wonderful comic so-and-so was. And the other comic said, would you be quiet? His ears would be burning. <laughs> now, I know the comic that passed away. He would have loved that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hope when I pop my clogs, remember me in laughter or don't remember me at all. Yeah. P people that you've lost in your life, the things you remember about them is the laughter they brought you. And how, and how they made you feel. Well, it's the old quote, isn't it, about, you know, people won't remember what you said to them, won't remember what they saw in you, they only remember how you made them feel. Yeah, I think that I, I, I love coaches, you know, but I think you don't stop laughing when you get old. You get old because you stop laughing. You'll never get old, that's for sure. So what word makes you laugh, Adrian? Flatulence. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of bookended, isn't it? From a child to a, an older person, a yeah, fart is always funny. Yeah, because well, the first time I heard that, I didn't know there was a posh word for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other word that always made me laugh was fun dabby dozy. I don't know why. <laughs> From the crankies. It's just, just a word covers everything. You know, when you're in a good mood, uh, how you feeling? Fun dabby dozy. <laughs> Next question I was going to ask is what sound makes you laugh? But I think I might have uh, 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 had, <laughs> had a little peep into uh, what that could be. Let me think. Let me think. Yeah, we'll go with that one. <laughs> I've watched. Uh, when we went, one way I seen Blazing Saddles. I am not, my wife will verify this. I fell on the floor, Paul. I was on the floor. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Well, that is the ultimate fart gag, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah, sadly. <laughs> Brilliant. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Well, <clears throat> looking at my exam results, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd much rather be funny, much rather. But there are many people that are, are both, Stephen Fry, Peter Eustonoff, all these... You can be, you can be both, and it's a bonus to be both. But I, I, I quite, I'd be quite happy if someone stood up at the end and said, "He was a funny so and so." I'll do me. So well, that's uh, that's brilliant. And finally, Adrian, desert island gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is it? Ooh. Now, for the next six or seven hours, we will be recording ones. <laughs> Funny enough, I'm, humor is more direct in its interpretation of history than history books are. Because it is seen from both sides of the victor and the vanquished. It's amazing that, isn't it? Most history books are, are written from the side of the people that win battles or, or dominate people. I'm going to prove to you now that history uh, and, and life doesn't really change that much. This joke goes way back, I think even to the 1400s. There's two guys coming home from the pub one night. Were the pubs in the 1400s? So. Sure. I'm sure. Pint of year. And they were walking through the graveyard and they got lost. And I thought they'd wait till the morning. So they take up the time, they thought they'd read what's on the headstones. And one was reading one quite a way away and the other fellow was reading and he started laughing. And the other fellow came running over. He said, Charlie, what are you laughing at? He said, look at this. He said, here lies an honest man and a politician. He said, what's funny about that? He said, you'd wonder how they got the two of them in the same coffin. <laughs> <laughs> Topical today as it was in the 1400s. Well, you put it on whoever you want. It's a great gag. 
Uh, I work with a, an old vaudeville comic called Albert Modley, and it was a tribute to him. Uh, it was my generation in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, 60s and 70s. He was in his 80s and he was retiring. I was at a function in Morecambe and uh, he, I think he told that joke that night or somebody else did and I'd never heard it. And it, it always stuck in my head. It's a great gag and you've been a great guest. Um, I think you can be guaranteed that whenever you go, which will hopefully in be in about 45 years time, they yeah. will say he was a funny so-and-so. Can I stop um, you there? I know what I want on my headstone. Oh my goodness, what's that? He's not here yet. <laughs> Adrian Walsh, you are a funny so-and-so, and and I thank you so much for being a brilliant guest on the Humorology podcast. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.